Did you know that Jesus prayed for us? Before he died, he prayed for us specifically. And this is what he prayed in John chapter 17, verse 20. John 17, 20, Jesus said, my prayer is not for them alone, speaking of his disciples. He said, I pray also for those who will believe in me through their message, that's us, that all of them may be one. Father, just as you are in me and I am in you, Jesus prayed for us, and he prayed something specifically, didn't he? That we be one, united, undivided. And when you look at the early church, right at the beginning of Acts, it looks so good, man. They're sharing everything. If somebody has a need, they sell some property, give their money to the person in need. Everything is great. It's kumbaya. So what happened? Are we one today? I think the church has never been more divided. Never been more conflict. Never been more interpersonal conflict and conflict between churches and between denominations. By one estimate today, there are over 45,000 denominations in our world. Do you hear me? 45,000 denominations. One estimate says that a new denomination is formed every eight minutes. What? Yeah, what is right? Seems crazy. We're becoming more and more divided. And it's not just with denominations the world over. It's within churches. There are church splits like the one I shared about last week that I experienced when I was a teenager. The church I loved tore in half. Half going to one new church and the other half staying. And what's the worst for me is that my best friend Ben went with the church split. And not with me. I lost my best friend, my only Christian friend. That interpersonal conflict we experience is so awful. And some of you have experienced it maybe within a church, maybe from a pastor, maybe just from a Christian friend. And you're like, I thought they'd be friend for life. And look at them now. How did this happen? There's too much division today in the church. I don't think that's what Jesus prayed for, was it? So we're going to talk about that today. Because we look around at a very imperfect church in our world. Even here in Arise Church. It's imperfect. But we've got to do better. We've got to strive to be undivided. So I have a big idea for you guys today, you know, and, and we're going to look at four different points. But the big idea is this. Don't let differences divide. Choose unity in diversity. Don't let our differences divide us. We should be undivided and choose unity in diversity around Jesus, his love, and his mission. So if you're here, we are going to be jumping all over the Bible today. So you have your Bible. You, that's cool to get it open, but we're going to kind of be all over the place. If you use the YouVersion Bible app, I have all the scriptures that we're going to be covering today right in the YouVersion Bible app. You can find the Arise Church Denver event. And, and in particular, we're going to learn four different points about how we can actually make this happen to not let differences divide us, but to choose unity and diversity. So four things I think we all need to learn so, so we can get better at this. Four things that we need to learn um, and um, we're going to do it by particularly looking at a man by the name of John Mark. Um, uh, I don't know if you guys have noticed this. I, I have noticed it very much so. But over the last two years since the pandemic started, um, people now choose their churches based on different things. For a long time, it was based on theology. Like what you believe, you divide up into your different denominations in your churches. Then for a while, it was just like, um, you know, what church has the best preacher? <laughs> best programs, right? That, that's what it was for quite a while. But over the last two years, it's changed. People choose their churches now based on ideology. It's really fascinating. By some estimates, it's almost 40% of people switch churches over the last two years because of the ideology. Like, are they a Republican or Democrat? Did they support Trump or not? Did they uh, approve and support vaccines or not? Their position on masks. And that was one of the, the, the diff most difficult things. Like we all experienced like, okay, they're requiring masks. Should we not have masks? Should we have masks? Okay, now we're reopening. Should we have masks? I, I had a friend um, at, a, at a big church. Um, he had one giver in his church that had been there 10 years. Good friends of his gives, gave over $100,000 a year to the church. Yeah, we don't have any of those yet. Um, if you want to though, arisedenver.com slash give. We're looking for those $100,000 a year givers. But this guy gave $100,000 a year for years. He left my friend's church. Why? Because they said masks recommended. 
Not required, recommended. We recommend you wear masks. That's too far. Pushing the agenda. Plandemic. He's out. Some of you laugh and some of you are like, yeah, that is why I left that church, okay? $100,000 a year giver, you're welcome to come to Arise Church Denver. We do not require masks anymore. <laughs> yes, okay, we got one person clapping for that. Um, Russell Moore, who's a public theologian, works for Christianity Today. He was asked, like, uh, in our country, how many churches have had to deal with people leaving their church or divisiveness because of these ideologies? And Russell Moore says, I don't know of a single church that hasn't been impacted. 100% of churches in our country have had division because of ideology. Political positions. Thoughts about things like masks or vaccine or a position on January 6th. Churches are more divided than ever. And we need to do better. Andy Stanley said this. He said, difference is inevitable. Division is a choice. Our nation chose poorly. The church followed suit. I think he's right. Our nation has never been more divided. And we need to provide an alternative to our world. We must be undivided. Because the world's watching. The world's watching. So we're going to look at John Mark, like I said. You guys all know John Mark in the Bible, right? It's crickets, just crickets. People are like, I know David, I've heard of him, Jesus, yeah. John Mark, who's that? I'm glad you asked. John Mark, that's who we're going to be looking at today. And John Mark, in case you guessed it, is the guy who tradition tells us wrote the gospel according to Mark. Okay, John Mark was his name, you know, kind of has a Jewish name and a Greek name. That's kind of how they did it in the old, uh, so sometimes he's called John, sometimes he's called Mark, but... Uh, often you see him as John Mark. So I'm gonna call him John Mark today. You guys got that? And the first time we are introduced to him as a character is actually a bizarre story. We're not 100% sure this is about him, but I'm pretty sure it was him. And it comes at the very end of the Gospel of Mark. He had an encounter with Jesus as a very young man. This is a bizarre story. So this is the, the night Jesus is betrayed and taken away to be arrested. And there's this scene that happens in Mark chapter 14. In Mark chapter 14, if we can pull up that verse, in Mark 14, it says, a young man, so this would have been a teenager, maybe 12, 13, 14, somewhere in there, a young man wearing nothing but a linen garment was following Jesus. When they seized Jesus, he fled naked, leaving his garment behind. Have you guys read that before? Some of you are like, what the heck is that? This is probably a teenager, John Mark. He's going out. He, he knows there's all this thing. He probably lived in Jerusalem. He, he, as we're going to find out in a little bit, his mom was a follower of Jesus. And, and he might not have had a dad. And he's going out as this timid little teenager with his sheet wrapped around him at night. Jesus is out praying in the garden all night. And he might have been, they, they think, you know, he would have just worn his like undergarments, a loincloth. Okay. So he's out in his whitey tighties with a sheet wrapped around him. And he goes and sees Jesus in the garden. And as the soldiers come up to arrest Jesus, Judas kisses him, they betray him, and they take him away. He is terrified, loses his sheet, and he's running away in his whitey tighties. If you guys don't think that's funny, I don't know what's wrong with you, okay? Just imagine that, okay? And Mark, this was actually a kind of a common thing in the ancient world. If you were the biographer, if you were the writer of something, he's, he's the biographer. Like, you don't include yourself. You kind of leave yourself anonymous. Plus, would you really want to name yourself for that event? So this is probably the first time we're introduced to Mark. This little teenager, scared out of his wits because Jesus got arrested, running away naked. <laughs> yeah, poor guy. <laughs> poor guy. So that's Mark when he's first introduced. He comes up again in the book of Acts. So we're going to look at Acts 12. So the first time we see him is this little scaredy teenager. Now he's probably a decade older or so late 20s, early 30s, a young man still in those, considered in those days. And Peter has begun to preach in the early church. And Peter is preaching in Acts chapter 12, um, gets arrested for preaching about Jesus, that Jesus had risen from the dead. And while Peter's in prison, an angel comes, miraculous story, lets Peter out of prison. And he goes to this house that was owned by John Mark's mom. John Mark's mom was the leader. There's no mention of the dad. That's why we think, you know, he probably died at this point. John Mark wasn't raised with the dad. That could explain some of his issues. Um, I don't know. 
But here he is at his mom's house. His mom was probably uh, one of the main leaders of the early church because she opened up her home for the prayer meeting that was happening that night for Peter who was in prison. And, And we pick this up in verse 12. It says that Peter went to the house of Mary, the mother of John, also called Mark, where many people had gathered and were praying. So probably John Mark is there as well. So this miracle happens. Peter gets let out of prison by an angel, shows up at their house, knocks on the door, and they're like, what the heck? Peter's here. Like, it's an amazing miracle. John Mark is there. His mom's one of the leaders of the church. And then we pick it up again. You see him the next time in verse 25. It says that when Barnabas and Saul, who we know as Paul, okay, had his name change. Um, So Barnabas and Paul in verse 25, um, had finished their mission, they returned from Jerusalem, taking with them John, also called Mark. So Paul and Barnabas, two partners in ministry, are going out on a missionary journey, one of the very first missionaries to be sent out, like Beth Ann, okay? Paul and Barnabas are going together in, as a team, and they're like, hey, let's bring John Mark with us. He's a young guy, he's got energy. Let's bring him along. He can be like our assistant pastor. This guy's got the first internship in church history, There he is in verse 25. But sadly, in verse 4 of chapter 13, it says the two of them, Paul and Barnabas, sent on their way by the Holy Spirit, went down to Seleucia and sailed from there to Cyprus. When they arrived at Salamis, um, they proclaimed the word of God. We, 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 I, sorry, I skipped something. John was with them as their helper. You guys see that? As Paul and Barnabas go on, on this first missionary endeavor ever, John is their helper. He's the assistant, right? The intern. Great. This is, that's a good start to this guy, okay? Much better than the naked um, scene we saw earlier. But then if you jump down to verse 13, things don't go so well for John Mark. It says, from, from Paphos, Paul and his companions sailed to Perga and Pamphylia, where John left them to return to Jerusalem. He's been with them a few weeks. They're at their first stop, he quits. He quits. He's done. He's like, I got to go home. I miss my mom. Okay, Mark is not turning out well very in the Bible, is he? Okay, John Mark has it bad. He's running away naked, scared, and now he's on his first missionary journey, gets homesick, and goes home. We're not told why, but he just is like, I'm out. I can't make it through this journey. I can't be the assistant. Sorry, I can't be your helper anymore. I got to go home where mom is. How embarrassing, right? How embarrassing for John Mark. But it gets worse for him. If you look down in verse 36 of chapter 15, this is going to be our main section that we're going to focus on for a little while. It says in verse 36, Sometime later, Paul said to Barnabas, remember these guys are the partners, they're the friends, let us go back and visit the believers in all the towns where we preach the word of the Lord and see how they are doing. So they've gone on their first missionary journey. About three years later, they're back, and they're like, let's go back to those churches, help build them up, strengthen them. And in verse 37, it says, Barnabas wanted to take John, also called Mark, with them. But Paul did not think it wise to take him because he had deserted them in Pamphylia and had not continued with them in their work. Barnabas is the cousin of John Mark. It doesn't tell you this, but you can read it. Elsewhere in the epistles, Barnabas is like, hey, we got to bring my young cousin, okay? John Mark may have messed up. He may have deserted us. That's the word they use. Much stronger than he just left to go home. He deserted them when they needed him. Barnabas is like, let's give him a second chance. John Mark, he's a young guy. His dad wasn't around much. Like, let's give him another chance. And Paul says, no. Paul says, hey, this is hard work. It's a difficult journey. Why would we take away the guy, bring the guy with us who abandoned us last time? Why would we bring them? And this is interesting. This is probably the first major conflict between two people we see in the church. There was a little bit of a discussion and conflict that happened earlier in chapter 15, but they resolved it pretty quickly. But here, Paul and Barnabas, these partners who had gone on missionary trips together, done some amazing work, are having a fight. Conflict. It's between Paul and Barnabas. So Barnabas, if you don't know, his nickname is Son of Encouragement. This is the kind of guy you want as your friend, okay? He's an encourager. He's a friend. He's the, like, I need somebody like that because he's always like, come on, you can do this. You got this, Paul. You got it, man. Yeah. Everybody loves a Barnabas. 
Barnabas is very optimistic, right? Even though his, his photo right there might not show that. There was a recent like, video depiction of, of the, the book of Acts, and this is Barnabas from that, in case you've ever seen it. So Barnabas, he's like, we gotta take John Mark. He's my cousin, so there's a little bit of like family drama here. He's like, we gotta give him another chance. This is a guy who is very much in grace, right? We need second chances. But Paul, who was this like hard-nosed leader of the early church, you like that picture of Paul? It was a little intense, right? Paul, it was really intense, okay? He had the job of searching out Christians and killing them before he actually became a Christian. Paul is like, this is a tough job to go. We will be in prison. People will try to kill us. Why would we take with us this wimp? He probably said it nicer than that. But that's what he was thinking. It's interesting, this disagreement that they're having, can't you see both sides of it? Like Barnabas is like, let's give the kid a second chance. He messed up once, grace. Paul is like, no, this is hard. We need to have standards. It's interesting here because you can see both sides. This is not a biblical issue. They, they, it doesn't even say like the Holy Spirit made it clear that this is what they were supposed to do when they fought about it. No, this is how it is in churches. There are so many conflicts over things that aren't biblical things. They're not primary issues, they're secondary, tertiary, minor issues, things that don't even have anything to do with the scripture. I am looking for the chapter and verse on masks. I've been searching all over. So if you can find it, tell me. Tell me. I'm looking for the verse that says you have to vote Republican or you have to vote Democrat. I haven't found it. And yet we fight over these things, don't we? So they're having this fight. I wonder if some of the tension was some of this. Like, if you can see, there's, you know, Paul and Barnabas. Um, but some of their disagreements, if we can jump forward a couple slides. Um, if we can see, maybe their disagreement was, was standards versus second chances. Paul is saying, hey, we've got to have standards for leaders in ministry. He would set that in 1 Timothy and Titus. He's like, if you're going to be a leader in ministry, whether you're going to be a deacon, a servant leader, or if you're going to be an elder or a pastor in the church, like you've got to live a life that's an example for others. There are high standards we have to set if we're going to be leaders. And since he's an assistant leader, we need to hold those high standards. But Barnabas is like, give the kid a second chance. Yeah, he messed up. He didn't meet the standards, but we've got to let him try again. It's three years later. He's matured. He's learned from that. Can't you see that tension there? Or, or maybe the tension was between the organization and the individual. This is always a tension in the church. Okay, this individual, we care about them, we love them, we wanna focus on this person and help them follow Jesus, but the organization is suffering because they're not doing what they're supposed to be doing. This is an issue we deal with all the time in the church. Oh, don't you care about the individual? Yeah, but they're not doing their job. Can you not fire someone just because they work on church staff? You guys thought about this? I have to think about this kind of stuff, right? There's always that tension between the organization and the individual. What comes first? What's more important? Some of you are like, for sure the individual. Some of you are like, well, no, because the organization has to move forward. Tension's still today, isn't it? Maybe the tension was between grace and truth. Paul is like, the truth is, this is hard. If you don't meet these standards, it's not gonna work. Barnabas is like, we're all about grace. Jesus loved us when while we were still sinners. So who's right here? Who thinks Barnabas is right? We've got some hands. Who thinks Paul's right? Some of you are too nervous to even vote, right? <laughs> yeah, that's more conflict, right? Why don't you take a side? <sighs> it's really interesting in the church is that there's sometimes there are problems to solve. Here's a right, here's a wrong. But a lot of the time, there's just tensions that you have to manage. Which one is it, grace or truth? Yes. We at our church have decided we're gonna hold both of them 100% all the time. The truth of what God says and to give grace to people who need it. Always. 100% both. 100% we're gonna care about the individual and the organization. 100% we're gonna care about evangelism and discipleship. That's a big one. Should the church reach out to the lost or should they care about the people that are in the church? Yes. Because whenever you go to one side or the other, like you're failing something. So you have to hold both, but it causes so much tension and there's tension all the time and it causes conflict. 
So my first point to you guys, my first point is that we need to disagree in love. Disagree in love. You can, should, and will disagree with people in the church, with other Christians. You will disagree. Sometimes you're like, well, it is 100% true in the Bible, maybe. But a lot of times it's not that clear. It's not black and white. It's a tension. So we can and probably should disagree on some things, but we've got to do it in love. And I'm not even saying just, just don't ever say anything if you disagree. Did I say that? No. They had a disagreement about this. The early church, yeah, that perfect early church, they're having this big disagreement about this issue. And, and I don't think they actually did this very well. So I'm not saying follow Paul and Barnabas' example here, because as we'll see in a second, they didn't do this. But later on, Paul would talk about this. I think he learned from this first conflict in the church. Everything was going great up to this point, now a major conflict. But this is what Paul writes later to the Ephesian church. In Ephesians chapter four, Paul says, be completely humble and gentle. Be patient, bearing with one another in what? Love. Make every effort to keep the unity of the spirit through the bond of peace. In these two verses, he packs so much in there. We've gotta be humble because we've gotta realize, yeah, I might think I'm right, but I might be wrong. Like, can we have at least a little bit of humility? There's been so many times where I thought, oh, I can't believe this person would do it, and I met with them, and I asked them, like, what's going on? And they're like, oh, that, that's not actually what happened. I'm like, oh, I'm glad I asked. I've made that mistake before. Have you guys? Glad we talked about it. That's not what actually happened. We've got to be humble and approach it like maybe we are wrong. Maybe this thing that we hold so tightly in our fist, we need to hold a little looser. I'm not saying let go. We've got to have convictions. But just hold it just a little looser and say in humility, maybe I'm not perfect and have everything figured out. So be completely humble and gentle. Here's the thing, you might be right, but if you're mean, you're wrong. (laughs) You have to be gentle. There's not enough gentle men and gentle women anymore. Really, Jesus was considered gentle and humble in heart. That's what he's described as. Gentle and humble in heart. The only time in all the scriptures it talks about Jesus' heart is when it says that he's gentle and humble. Jesus was gentle. He was strong, man. He was tough, but he was gentle with people. He loved them. He had compassion on them. And that's the next thing, be patient. It's amazing how many times I see someone so mad. How could this person in the church do that thing? How could they believe this or hold that political position? And I'm like, it's because they're a baby Christian. Maybe they've never read the scripture about that. Maybe nobody's ever talked to them. Are you going to be patient with them in their growth? Are you gonna go to them and say, hey, let's talk about this. Could could we read the scriptures together and find out? We have to be patient with people because we never know where they are on their spiritual journey. They can't have every single thing figured out right away. They just can't. It's like, well, they got baptized. Shouldn't they have every sin in their life gotten rid of? Well, do you? No, okay? We're gonna be patient with you. You better be patient with others. I'm serious. And then he says the next thing, bearing with one another in love. Bearing means you say, yeah, you have an issue, you have a problem, I disagree with you or whatever, but I'm gonna come alongside you and I'm gonna help bear the load. I'm not just gonna rebuke you, but I'm gonna say, you're having some issues with that? Well, John Mark, maybe it's because you didn't have a dad around to teach you to have a tough spine. Like, let Like, I'll be your spiritual dad for you. I'll I'll hang out with you. I'll I'll do that for you, man. Maybe we just need to bear with one another. That's what it takes to have unity. Make every effort. That's what love is, isn't it? That's what love is. It's not easy. It's not easy. Don Carson, the theologian, says, um, maybe the reason why there are so many commands in the Bible to love other Christians is because it's hard to do. (laughs) Because it's hard to do. That's why we have to be reminded over and over to love one another, love one another, love one another, love one another. By this, all men will know that you are my disciples if you love one another. It's hard to do because we disagree. People that are followers of Jesus, even in our church, come from all sorts of different nations and backgrounds, political ideologies, ethnicities, political positions, parts of the country, 
socioeconomic status, and they all come together. In any other setting, we would probably be enemies. Seriously. Sometimes you're like, what the heck unites us here today? Love. The love that Jesus has for us, that we have for him, and we, through Jesus, have for each other. It's gotta take the love. And, and this is what I would recommend. After you have that disagreement with someone, you disagree, if you're like, well, was it done in love? You should ask this question. Does the person know that I love them? What if you just ask yourself that question? After I had talked with them, do they know that I loved them? Maybe before you talk with them, like, how can I make sure this person knows I love them because I'm about to say something hard? Wounds from a friend can be trusted, it tells us in the Proverbs. It means I've got to let them know that I am their friend that loves them as a brother or a sister. And then ask yourself, do they love me? Maybe you should just ask them. Okay, instead of just wondering, yeah, I think they know. Well, did you ever tell them? Mm. Did you say something that somebody could misconstrue as, as thinking you hate them? Well, yeah, probably. Okay, ask them, do you know that I love you? And if they're like, ah, I don't know right now. Well, I do. Let me show it to you by my actions. I care about you. I love you. Disagree in love. You guys got that first point? Disagree in love. We don't have to agree on everything. We can and should disagree on some things, but we must do it in love. First thing, disagree in love. The second thing, the second point we're gonna learn is to never be divisive. We can disagree, but not be divisive. And that's what we need to learn because that's not what happens in Acts chapter 15. In fact, if you keep reading in verse 39, it says that Paul and Barnabas had such a sharp disagreement that they parted company. Barnabas took Mark and sailed for Cyprus. And Paul took Silas and left. We'll get to that in a minute. They parted company from a sharp disagreement. This word sharp disagreement, we get the English word paroxysm from. If you don't know what that word means, that's fine. It's a bizarre word. It's only used a few times in the Bible. In the Greek version of the Old Testament, it's a word that's used for God's anger and wrath. There's wrath going on here. In the New Testament, it's used one other time in the book of Revelation when it says the heavens rolled up like a scroll. The heavens are being torn asunder. That's what happened between Paul and Barnabas, a sharp disagreement. This is a major conflict. I don't know if there were fisticuffs. There might have been. You saw those pictures of those dudes. I think Paul could throw down, okay? But whatever the conflict was, it was not good. And so much, they're like, we can't even spend time in the same room together. Paul and Barnabas, the heroes of the early church, these guys were like the first missionary journey. They planted churches all over the ancient world. And now they can't even stand to be in the same room with each other. It's sad, isn't it? that there was a division, there was divisiveness in the early church. So I'm telling you this, I told you the whole point of this service series was twofold. One, to lower your expectations of what the church could be, okay? You won't find the perfect church, and if you do, don't go there, because you'll ruin it, okay? There are no perfect churches, lower your expectations. And secondly, we need to raise our actions. So lower expectations, at the very beginning, okay? They've only been going for a few years, there's a major disagreement, first church split here. It happened in the book of Acts. Let alone you read the rest of the epistles. Man, there was some messed up stuff going on in church. It really was. So you need to lower your expectations, but we also need to raise our actions because this is not okay. And I think Paul knew it too. And I think he learned from this. And, and later on, he wrote to Titus, who was a young pastor. And he wrote to Titus, he said, avoid foolish controversies and genealogies and arguments and quarrels about the law because these are unprofitable and useless Stop arguing and fighting over these little matters. And he gave this instruction. Get this. This is a tough word. In, in Titus 3.10, he says, warn a divisive person once and then warn them a second time after that. Have nothing to do with them. If you're divisive, three strikes and you're out. And this is to the elders. This is the leaders of the church. They're shepherds of the church. Titus was one of the early the pastors. It's like, if somebody is divisive in your church, you can't let them in your church. That's a pretty harsh word, isn't it? Because all it takes is one person to divide an entire church. Start having parking lot meetings. Have you heard of those? Be like, I can't believe the pastor said that. We need to meet together. I've seen this happen. It divides churches. Division, there, it leads, first it's like gossip, then sharing opinions, and then slander, and then the church is split. 
So don't be divisive. You can disagree, but you must disagree in love. In love. There's a line that, that we've taken. We use it as our, at our church here when we talk about, we have a 12-point statement of faith. These are the things we believe. Okay, but we say this, in essentials, unity. In non-essentials, liberty. In all things, charity. You know what charity means? It's an old word for love. On the important things, we're gonna hold firm. We're gonna hold fast. For everything else, we have liberty, freedom to have different opinions. What's your view of how old the earth is? Okay, We don't fight over that here. Whether you can speak in tongues or tongues don't exist at all, or, or what the heck are tongues? Like beef tongue that you get at the burrito place? Like, I don't want that. Okay, We don't fight over tongues here. We don't. It's a non-essential, but in all things, we choose love. We choose love. Don't be divisive. If you absolutely cannot make it, go to another church, okay? Seriously. Because we're not gonna be divided as a Rise Church Denver. We're not. We are not gonna allow it. And, and that's why I'm teaching you guys, don't be divisive. Don't be divisive. Um, and and that's, that's really important for us uh, to learn because I don't know if you guys know this, but I have some strong opinions. I really do. I have strong opinions about the, the random thing like Metallica, the most overrated rock band ever. <gasps> There's a gas there. Pineapple belongs on pizza. I don't care what Michi says down the street. Pineapple belongs on pizza. Okay, we, I, I have strong opinions about everything, okay? I really do. You can ask the staff. They're like, why are you going on a rant again about which Star Wars movie is best? Return of the Jedi. Ooh, that's an unpopular opinion, isn't it? Some people are like, oh my gosh. We can have strong opinions about things, but we've got to realize, you don't hear me preaching about those things, do you? I'm not tweeting about them. I'm not. Because I don't want to be divided over these tiny little things that don't even matter. We, we just don't do that. And we can't do that as a church. Don't be divisive. Just because even you have a strong opinion about something, if it's not an essential thing, let's not fight about it. Sometimes just keep your mouth shut. Or say it like, it's okay if you disagree with me on this. Like, we don't have to convince everybody of everything all the time. We don't. We don't. And I think that's so important for us today. So that's the second thing we need to learn. It is to never be divisive. But the third thing, don't slander, celebrate. Don't slander, celebrate. Celebrate. The word slander, from, from the biblical word, it just means speak bad. If you ever speak bad about a person, even if it's true, it's slander. Did you know that? Don't speak bad about someone. Instead, celebrate. Instead, celebrate them. It's interesting. They have this huge disagreement. They fight. They split. It's bad. And in verse 39, as we continue it, it says that Barnabas took Mark and sailed for Cyprus, but Paul chose Silas and left, commanded by the believers to the grace of the Lord. He went through Syria and Cilicia, strengthening the churches. What I think is so interesting is that they had this major disagreement, this fight, this division. It's sad. It shouldn't have happened. But you know what happened out of it? Two missionary journeys. And they were just going to go strengthen churches in one area, which Barnabas and John Mark actually did. But then Paul takes Silas, they go north into modern-day Greece and Macedonia, and they actually plant three new churches. The church in Philippi, Corinth, um, and one other church um, got started because they left. So they don't just go to strengthen churches like their original plan. They go plant new churches. The kingdom of God is expanding. There's an amazing thing that God does. We choose division. God chooses multiplication. Did you know that? God uses division for multiplication. He's like, if you're going to divide churches, now there's two churches reaching more people. That church was, was struggling to reach the young people, so all the young people left and started a new church. Now they're reaching the young people and the old people. I'm not saying it's a good thing, but it's something that God uses, and that's what he does. He uses even division for his multiplication. He does, and, and Paul learned from this. Paul learned from this later, and, and in the book of Philippians, when he's in prison at the end, he's like, why are we fighting over this stuff? He says that some preach Christ out of selfish ambition. These guys are bad guys. 
not sincerely, supposing that they can stir up trouble for me. People while I'm in prison are preaching so that I will get in trouble. But then he says, but what does it matter? The most important thing is that in every way, whether from false motives or true, Christ is preached. And because of this, I rejoice. Yes, and I will continue to rejoice. I am celebrating because now there's more people preaching the gospel, even though they hate me. Isn't that interesting? Paul gets it now at that stage later in the game. He's like, man, I I wish that division had never happened. I wish there's no division. But since there is, let's just celebrate other Christians, other churches, other denominations. Do you know we can do that? We should do that. We will disagree. And about some things that I think are pretty biblical, and I'm like, hey, no, that's a, that's a pretty big issue for me. And for some other person, they're like, yeah, it's a huge issue for me. I can't, that, that's fine. We can disagree. We can have more than one denomination. I do not think that one third of the world would be Christian today. One third, did you guys know this? One third of our uh, world claims the name of Christ today. I do not think that would be possible if there was only one denomination. I don't. Every denomination has a little bit different flavor. They're better at certain things than others. Let's just be honest about it. Let's be honest. Presbyterians, man, they got order figured out. They, they know how to structure their pastors and their, their nomination. You look at the Anglicans, they have this really cool ritual service in the order of how they do things. It, you, you look at the tr- traditions of the Roman Catholics, like they hold those things strong. And then you look at the charismatics, man, they are praying for healing and seeing way more healing than us. Maybe we need to learn from them. See the Pentecostals praising Jesus with all they got? Like, man, I wish I could could do that too. We've got to realize every denomination, every church has something special in it. And let's celebrate those differences. Can we do that? Let's celebrate the fact that Go Church and Journey Point Church are here in Central Park. That St. Stephen's is down the street. Yeah, let's celebrate. We love these guys. Let's celebrate that Red Rocks Church is putting out some killer music on the west side of town. Right? Let's celebrate a few more minutes. I'm going a little long. She's like, you're over, man. <laughs> I'm only on point three, though. <laughs> Thank you, Laura. <laughs> That's like what she's supposed to do for me. Huh? Okay, forgive me, Laura. Um, but we've got to celebrate each other's differences, right? Let's rejoice. I want to show you guys something. Do you know what we call denominations? There's like one other thing in our world that we talk about with denominations. Do you know what they are? Money. I want to ask you guys, which one's better? This $100 bill or these 520s? Like, which one's better? (laughs) Some of you are like, well, I want the crisp $100 bill because then I got more room in my wallet. Somebody else is like, I don't need more room in my wallet. I want more bills because then I can spread it around. Like, spread the, like, it doesn't even matter, right? When we talk about denominations of money, these are different denominations. They mean the same thing. It's like the same value, okay? Denominations in the church It's still one church. It's Jesus' church. And that's what we believe. So we've got to believe. We've got to celebrate our differences. Celebrate them. And the fourth point, reconcile when possible. Reconcile when possible. Put this money away so I don't tempt anybody. Reconcile when possible. It's interesting. We don't know when or how it happened. We're not given details, but later on, Paul, when he writes the letter to the Corinthian church, he talks about Barnabas as his equal. He's not mad at Barnabas. They're like, we're both leaders in the church. Paul, who wrote 13 books of the New Testament, is like, Barnabas, he's right up there with me. Equals. And what's even more incredible is what happens with John Mark. In Philemon, Paul writes to this a uh, man uh, named Philemon, and he says, Epaphras, my fellow prisoner in Jesus Christ, sends you greetings, and so do Mark, Aristarchus, Demas, and Luke, my fellow workers. We're teammates now. Somehow they had got back together and started working together again. Paul, who had completely rejected John Mark. There's no way I'm taking him, even if it causes a breach of our friendship, breach of our ministry, divisions happening. Paul later is now friends and a fellow worker with John Mark. And then at the end of Timothy, most people think that 2 Timothy was the last letter that Paul ever wrote. He writes to another young pastor. He says, only Luke is with me. Get Mark and bring him with you because he is helpful to me in my ministry. I'm by myself, old, dying in prison. I want John Mark. There's been reconciliation that's happened. Isn't that beautiful? I find that so beautiful. 
We should be told what happened. But I do know that Paul would write in Romans chapter 12, 18, some words for us. He says, if it is possible, if it's possible, as far as it depends on you, live at peace with everyone. Reconcile when you can. Reconcile when you can. And this is so hard to do, but so important. A few weeks ago, I tried to reach out to someone that I hadn't reconciled with. Yes, that's happened to me. Left them a voicemail, haven't heard back. It was one of those like, please don't pick up the phone. I don't know if I want to have this conversation. They didn't, I left a voicemail. I'm, I'm still ready. I'll, I'll, I'll probably take some other steps. Reconcile when you can. It might have taken them years or decades to reconcile. We don't know. But what's really cool is that John Mark actually became the assistant to Peter and probably helped him write the first letter to Peter, first Peter. And we know that historians think that Mark, the gospel according to Mark, was the very first gospel ever written. Mark hung out with Peter so much that he wrote down Peter's account of what Jesus said. The reason why we have the gospel of Mark is because John Mark stuck with it. And I'm so glad there was some reconciliation there. And we should pursue it as well. We should pursue it as well. So I want you to think about who do I need to reconcile with? You might still be livid at this person. How could they do this? How could they leave me? How could they betray me? Do we need to forgive? Do we need to seek one step in reconciliation? Who's that person that's on your mind right now? How are you going to reconcile with them? How are you going to pray blessing on them? Do you know we're supposed to pray blessings for even our enemies? Just imagine what the world would think if they started seeing this in the church. I mean, already, like, we're the only group that has... You know, people of different ethnicities, genders, political positions coming together. What if, we, what if we did it like the church over in Estonia? You guys heard about this a few weeks ago. In Estonia, where there's 45,000 Ukrainian refugees coming into that country. The Russian Christians started a new ministry to minister to these moms who don't have the husbands because they're fighting the war in Ukraine. The Russians are ministering to the Ukrainians and the Estonians and the American missionaries are helping watch the kids because they don't speak the same language. Their countries are at war with each other. They have every reason to be divided and hate each other. And they are ministering, serving, and loving one another. That's what the church can and should do. Imagine if we did that here in Denver. It's really interesting. In John 17, 20, I shared you at the very beginning of that prayer that Jesus did. And, and Laura, now you can come on. In verse 20, um, Jesus said, may they also be in us. Uh, I'm sorry, verse, I'm, I'm jumping ahead. My prayer is not for them alone. I also pray for those who believe in me through their message, us, that all of them may be one, Father, just as you are in me and I am in you. And why? He tells the purpose in verse 21. May they also be in us so that the world may believe that you have sent me. Our unity as Christians can lead other people to faith in Jesus Christ. It's mission critical that we are united as Christians. People are lost and going to hell every single day. And it might be because we have too much conflict in the church. But if on the other hand, we love each other, even in our differences, then we can reach the lost for Christ. And it's mission critical, it's important. Let me tell you, when, I took Kanan, when we took Kanan to the hospital a couple weeks ago with Croup, he couldn't breathe. When we went into that hospital room at the beginning and we just rushed in there, we're terrified, right? Do you know what I said to the first nurse that came in? Are you Democrat or Republican? <laughs> of course I didn't, right? Who cares? Because the mission is important. We've got, this is so much more important than any of our differences. I just want to know that they're a nurse that can take care of my son, that it's a doctor that can help us. And they did. Thank you, Children's Hospital. You guys are awesome. Because it was way more important than these petty differences we have. And yes, those are petty differences. And that's what we need to do as a church. Be united. Because the mission is critical. There are way more important things. The lost are dying all around us. We must be a better church. By being united and not divided. Let's pray. Lord God, um, we have been a divided church. We've been divided into denominations. I pray that you bring unity. We pray that the unity of all Christians in every church would one day be restored. And until then, Lord, help us disagree in love. Help us not be divisive. Help us reconcile when possible because the mission is too important. I pray this in Jesus' name.
we're gonna take communion together because even though we come from different backgrounds, some of you from different denominations, we don't care. We're coming together because there's one table, there's one loaf, and there's one cup. We're gonna share it together. So if you're online, find a bread or a cracker and some juice, even just some water, like anything will do. Let's do this together. And you, on your seats, you should have that little uh, communion bowl. Just open up the top, get that wafer out. Because the Lord Jesus, on the night he was betrayed, did you know that he was betrayed? His body literally was divided, his blood shed, so that we would be united. He was cut off from God himself, the Father, so that we could be united with him. So on the night he was betrayed, he took the bread, and when he broke it, he said, this is my body, broken for you. Do this in remembrance. In the same way after supper, he took the cup, saying, this cup is the new covenant in my blood. Do this whenever you drink it in remembrance of me. Lord Jesus, we thank you for dying on the cross for us, for setting an example that you were willing to be broken so that we would be united, so that we would be one, even though we come from different backgrounds and ethnicities, that we have different skin tones, Lord God, that we're from different countries and have different political positions and different ideologies, Lord. We are grateful that you died for every single one of us to reconcile us to God and in turn for us to be reconciled with one another in love. Father, would you help us to come together as one in this church, to be totally united. And because of that love, people would be drawn to you. That they'll know we are Christians by our love. I pray this in Jesus' name. Amen.